ladies and gentlemen, and also friends of Invest Hong Kong, I'm so honored to have the chance to kick off the NOAA 2021 during this challenging but interesting time. Congratulations to Informer Markets, um, especially for organizing such a trade fair, and uh, it is exciting to see all the four shows together cohabiting this year. Well, people from all over the world are geared towards a more healthy and balanced lifestyle. There is great potential and demand for natural and organic products. NOAA is always a great platform for visitors to learn more about the latest health trends and the newest products. And exhibitors can benefit from the show to market their products, find business partners and network with industry players. When I look at the program this year, what impressed me most is the collaboration of different organizations, which shows our target of reaching net zero by 2050 is possible. If we all do it together, we can play our parts. Today, you will hear from our good friend, Heidi uh, of Food Make Good, on the latest sustainability trend in the food service industry, and later, uh, case studies from speakers from hotel, bars, and restaurant groups. Every year, I look forward to NOAA to see and try something new, aiming to improve my beauty and also overall wellness. I'm sure they will not let you down this year. Tomorrow and on the last day, we can also learn about the differences and benefits from keto diet, plant-based diet, intermittent fasting, and even how to choose supplements. Um, due to time, I can only mention a few names here, but last but not least, our green queen, Salali, uh, she will tell us the tips on how to source green packaging, which is affecting uh, business nowadays. The world is going through a challenging time. Invest Hong Kong, as a government department, is more committed than ever to support and bring in more companies to Hong Kong and creating more jobs locally, and also help establish companies to expand and boost our Hong Kong economy. Please talk to us if you want to know more about our business matching initiatives and ongoing support to companies. We have a booth just next door, uh, just next to UK and Japan, and Japan Pavilion. May I wish you all a successful show. Thanks for your commitment to Hong Kong. Stay positive and we can do it together. Thank you. See you later. Thank you very much, Cindy, for your um, opening speech. Come on, let us invite Ms. Heidi Spurrow, the CEO of Food Made Good Hong Kong, to introduce to us the sustainability trends for the good food service industry. Followed by the F and B, um, followed by case studies of their member Solar Bow Straw as well. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. I'm Heidi Spurrell and uh, I run Food Made Good in Hong Kong. So um, for those of you who don't know, Food Made Good is a sustainability um, consultancy focused on food and we also run a members organization. Um, let me go here. Just a bit of tech. Issues. Okay, here we go. So this is what I'm planning to run through with you today. So we'll have a look um, first about what are we doing in terms of um, what's happening in the food service sector. And then we'll look at some trends that um, follow our framework. So sourcing society and environment. This follows the Food Made Good for framework. We'll also zone in to Asia, what's going on in this part of the world. and. Then we'll finish off with some um, consumer awareness and some best practices. Um, what kind of leadership um, impresses us at Food Made Good? And then finally, what does it mean for you in the audience in terms of the food service sector? And I really like this quote from Kerry that says, the gap between consumer intent and action is closing rapidly. And across all consumer archetypes, the importance of sustainability is irrefutable. 
So we're going to see this across all sectors, but in particular with food, when consumers are starting to act, when they say in a survey that they're intending to, to purchase sustainable brands, we're seeing um, the action um, for real rather than this big gap that we've had over the last few years. All right, before we get started, I'd really like to know who's in the room. So if you take your phone and I'd like to know which of you are in the food service sector, which of you are suppliers, because it really helps us kind of tailor what we're going to talk about. So I think we can show our poll now. Has everybody taken a picture of the, uh, was everybody able to take a picture of the, the QR code? Maybe we can go back to the QR code. There we go. So just let me know um, what sector you work in. Are you in food service? Are you a supplier? Are you neither? Is it working? OK, here we go. Let's see who you are. All right, a bit of a mixed bag, it seems. So you're in food service, some of you are in the supplier side, and some of you are just here to learn about trends, which is fantastic. OK. OK, so moving on, a little bit about our mission. As an organization, we're here to help the food service sector to um, get onto their sustainability journey, very much um, by providing support and guidance. And by doing so at scale, we hope to scale what we call a sustainable food system. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. This is how uh, we're set up. So we're very much um, a memberships organization. So bringing together what we call high street to high end, working with a whole wide range of brands. Um, through the membership, we audit restaurants on sustainability. Um, and year on year, we help them to increase their score by giving them recommendations, whether it's on food waste or plastic reduction or reducing meat uh, on their menu and increasing plant-based options. There's a whole range um, that are, is linked back to our framework. On the other side, we um, run consultancy projects where we're able to work with the more larger companies to help them on their sustainability journey and help them help their clients. So for example, later on, if you're here at 3 o'clock, we'll be talking through the Pernod Ricard project, um, who we've been supporting to train their bartenders. And then finally, campaigning. It's really important for us to have a little bit of a consumer-facing um, working with the consumers in order to educate from both sides. So we can't just be talking about sustainability with the businesses. We also need to be helping them to educate their, their consumers and their diners. So we've just started a partnership with HSBC, which is fantastic. And they'll be supporting us over the next 12 months um, to run this One Planet Plate campaign. And if you'd like to know more about that and you work in the food service sector and you're a chef, uh, we'd love to speak to you. Our booth is just over at the, behind you. Okay, so moving on, this is our framework. It's really important. Um, everything we do is underpinned by this, these three pillars, uh, sourcing, society, and environment. And as you can see, they're fully aligned with the SDGs, meaning it's a very holistic program. Um, for example, celebrating local and seasonal. So this is very much about what can you do in the context where in Hong Kong we're importing over 95% of our food. What does that mean for supporting local businesses? And then looking at um, serving more veg and better meat. So better meat is all about high welfare meat, um, uh, a meat that um, animals, where animals have grown and, and been able to exhibit their natural behaviors, for example. Sourcing sustainable seafood. That's very controversial this year, particularly if you've seen sea spiracy. So you know, how do restaurants and chefs source their seafood sustainably? Um, and so all of these areas have been honed over the last 10 years through working with think tanks, academics, caterers, food service. And this is what we define as sustainability for food service. So they're very important areas. And we are the leading and the largest um, sustainability audit company for restaurants. 
And this is, these are some of the challenges that we try to help our members on to just grasp and understand because the food system challenges are very complex. Um, there's no silver bullet. Um, we bring uh, the members up to date on regulations. For example, food waste, you might have heard that this bill passed last week, a couple of weeks ago, where residents will be charged for their waste. And this not currently affecting food service or restaurants, but um, it, it is obvious that it won't be voluntary for long where, where you're not managing your food waste properly. Um, we also know that plastics is a big subject. Um, but behind every plate of food, there are all of these challenges that the food service sector need to be aware of, especially if you look more upstream. Um, did you know, for example, that 70% of the world's grains are grown to feed animals? And this has a massive impact on deforestation. Um, antibiotic resistance is really starting to impact human health because we are feeding animals in factory farms too, much, um, too many antibiotics. So it's starting to impact humans in their ability to, to absorb um, antibiotics. Um, and then there are all of these other challenges, biodiversity. It's important for chefs to understand the wide range of ingredients that are available to us. Um, for example, heritage meats and so forth. Uh, what we're seeing is the world is, has been moving towards monocropping and, and eating the same crops, and that's not very good for our soils. So there's lots and lots of issues um, that we're trying to educate and inspire our members on in order to shift to more sustainable practices. Um, so before we um, move on to trends, I'd like to ask you what sustainability initiatives come to mind um, in a food service environment? So I just want to get a sense of what comes to mind um, when we think about sustainability in a restaurant? So if you could take out your phone again, and let's do a little, a little um, poll to see what you believe to be um, some of the areas that restaurants should be um, thinking about. And this can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be Hong Kong related. So once you've taken the picture, you'll have an option to answer three, three in three areas. What comes to mind? There's no right or wrong answer. Has everyone taken the picture? If so, I can show you our fancy little word cloud. OK. All right, let's see what you've come up with. Food print, that's great because we're doing, starting to do a lot of work around carbon footprinting of menus. It's really exciting. Some of you have said reducing waste, fair sourcing, more veggie options. So a really wide range of answers there. Well, we still have a few more coming in, but nothing dominant in terms of what you've answered. I like the um, local producer. It's, it's quite tricky in Hong Kong because we know that it, you know, some of the, the customers, the dining customers, they insist on having their green beans from Sicily or having their, you know, their, their meat um, from France. Um, there's lots of kind of norms that our, our customers um, are expecting. So how do you educate and shift you know, the diner? How do we elevate local ingredients so that they, they can um, have, have a better space in our menus and be valued. So that's really interesting. Maybe uh, my team can get a picture of this. We can, we can um, keep a record of it. So moving on to trends. This is what we're seeing in our research in terms of sourcing. Um, the whole reduction of meat um, in terms of uh, animal protein and um, an increase in plant-based alternatives, that's, that's continuing to grow. We've brought on quite a few plant-based alternative members this year, including uh, Tyndall and Karana, and th that is definitely a massive trend. In Hong Kong alone, 7% of the growth in food service outlets um, um, has been 
uh, we've seen a 7% growth in food service outlets in Hong Kong and 34% growth in grab and go, which is, is, is quite surprising because we, you know, during COVID, all of this is still happening. We're also seeing key office locations in Central and TST and Causeway Bay. And one report says that 43% growth in bubble tea. So there seems to be a lot of growth even amidst the, um, the pandemic and the troubles we've been having this year. We also noticed that there are emerging office locations in Kowloon East and Wan Chuk Hang. So we're based in Wan Chuk Hang, so we're definitely seeing a lot of new restaurants growing in that area. Um, sorry, let's look at the experience economy. So the aspiration of experience over ownership. We're seeing that people really care about experience over owning material items. So you've got a picture here of um, dining up in the sky in London. We're also seeing a lot of interest in supply chain, uh, supply chain transparency. So this idea that during COVID, we saw quite a lot of exposure of how vulnerable our supply chains are. You might have seen images of farmers having to throw away their milk. Um, you know, just in time um, supply chains, lots of problems with, with trying to get, get produce. Um, you may have experienced the food panda. Um, they're moving into grocery, so this whole convenience for um, um, so wanting products now and wanting them um, a wide range of products straight away. Um, the other area we're seeing a lot of interest is better business. So purpose and profit together. And then fifth, it's the universe, you know, the desire to be seen and served as unique. So that's a lot of that is happening on, um, on uh, social media. Okay, so this was the slide I was meant to, um, I was talking about earlier, sorry. So yeah, this is um, not slowing down this area for plant-based. We're also seeing interest in heritage and um, hyper-regional cuisines. So uh, an interest back with um, heritage meats and um, chefs really caring about this whole idea of sourcing, if not locally, but regionally. Flavors, ingredients, and experiences. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? Sorry? Banana heart, great, yeah, so the blossoms. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of chefs use this ingredient. So um, great that you recognize it. So bringing in all these ingredients that is traditionally seen as waste, you know, how we can sort of close the loop on that. And then also, you might have heard of um, the increase in seafood and superfood seaweeds. You may have heard of the term seaganism. We saw a report by MSC recently. There are, are people who identify um, as uh, those just eating um, a vegan diet, but also you know, complementing it with a little bit of fish for protein. Um, that's, that's quite an interesting area as well. Um, regen agriculture. It's a very big word, but basically means going back to the old ways of farming and really farming in line with nature rather than against nature. And then we have brand provenance, so really caring about where um, the story about where the foods are grown. Okay, and then if we think about um, the societal aspects, so that's the human side, how we feed people. We're seeing a lot of interest in health and nutrition for customers. People really caring and keenly aware of what they're eating and how that affects their health. The new focus is on gut health and links to immunity. Um, you'll probably see a lot of products around this area actually relating to that. We're also seeing um, passionate, mindful eaters listening to your body um, and determining when and what, what it needs um, to eat well and good. I've also noticed a lot around embracing activism, corporate activism. So taking a position on, um, you know, DNI on diversity and inclusion, taking a position on Black Lives Matters. So this is corporates taking um, a position um, on these aspects, and they're also incentivizing green behaviour. So reducing food waste and being more economical with water and, and energy, for example. And then lastly, thirdly, the environmental management um, of, of our supply chains, designing out waste. You might have heard about the circular economy. You know, how are we, um, especially with plastics, has anybody put their 
consultation, their opinion on in, in the public consultation. I think it's due tomorrow when the government's asking our opinion on um, if we should have a ban on plastic tableware. That's really important. The deadline's tomorrow, so I encourage you all to put your opinion in on, on that. So the, a ban is coming on, on plastics. Um, it's really important to be aware of what's happening in that space. Um, so designing out waste is um, super important. You've got organizations like the MacArthur, Ellen MacArthur Foundation supporting businesses in this area. Um, you've got large organizations like Nestle also taking a stance on these issues. So very much addressing supply chain waste as well. There's more pressure um, than ever on buyers and suppliers to cut down on waste in order to reduce costs, improve their return on investment, and to manage the resource scarcity. So I encourage you to look up the Ellen MacArthur Foundation if you're thinking about um, getting involved in um, a formal way to reduce your, your plastic waste output. Um, I wanted to highlight this fantastic program. Um, Circular City is a member of um, Fume Good, and they piloted a reuse system in um, DB. Um, really, really great that they were able to quantify how many plastic and single-use cups that they could save by, um, by running this pilot, this reuse pilot. And it just goes to show, um, if, you, if you can make it easy for the customer and not create barriers, because sustainability should be easy. It should just be part of everyday life. But if you make it easy, people will um, more, be more likely to embrace it. Um, we're also very excited about carbon footprinting. Hopefully soon you'll be able to see on the menus in restaurants the carbon footprint of each dish that you choose. That's something we're very excited working with our members on um, coming soon. Okay, so next up I'm going to zone in on these sustainability trends for Asia. Um, let's start first with traceability. People want to know where their food is coming from. Um, and that has definitely been heightened um, by, the, um, by, the, um, um, by COVID. So in terms of um, choice, so transparency in the sourcing supply, we already mentioned it, but it's also very apparent in, in Asia. Functional drinks are also gaining ground. Again, you'll see a lot of brands here today where there'll be a lot of narratives around gut health and, and well-being. Um, Non-dairy, um, that continues to grow. Um, these kind of functional drinks as well, um, good for health. Um, we're also seeing a big growth in the snacking market, not just during COVID, but also pre-COVID. People are not necessarily sitting down to three meals a day. They're, they're actually eating less but more frequently. And this, this is really quite an interesting trend. And then reducing sugar consumption in food as well as drinks. You know, Asia is not free from this obesity epidemic, it's really come to Asia, you know, this idea that we're all getting heavier. This kind of westernization of diets of fast food is really impacting um, Asia as well. So reducing salt, sugar, fat in foods, for, for us we're seeing a lot of brands just pushing the kind of health and sustainability angle on that. And then high protein and alternative proteins. Um, not just alternative, um, through, sorry, whoops, um, high protein um, and alternative proteins. So not just the, the processed packaged um, protein, we're also seeing these proteins that chefs can use. So Tyndall, one of our members, they've designed this alternative that chefs can actually manipulate and and add flavors to, so it's not just like an end product like you see with an Omnipork. Um, we're seeing these products being designed so that chefs can actually, um, you know, be very creative and, and use them for their own, um, own menus. Um, so going back to non-dairy, 60% of global dairy-free sales are in APAC, so that's a very high number indeed. This trend is driven by a growing number of flexitarians. If you haven't heard of flexitarian, it's the idea that you know, by default you will reduce your meat consumption um, and maybe just have it on a special occasion, at the weekend or when you visit family. So there's a large number of lactose intolerant customers um, in, in the region and in younger consumers, so that really helps the non-dairy growth. Um, 
And last of all, just back on the high protein, high protein dishes increased by 205% um, in China as consumers explore protein rich diets and try to reduce their intake of carbohydrates. And the ladies in the room will know that we're all trying to reduce the carbohydrates because um, they're definitely um, high on the calories. Okay, next up. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the diner is changing. So in terms of choice, um, a study by Kerry Group um, mentioned that 63% of consumers globally are influenced by a restaurant's sustainability attributes. So that's music to our ears. That's really important data because I think we, ne we never tell, we never say that, you know, customers are choosing restaurants because the restaurants are sustainable. It's more like the restaurants serve really delicious food, but they're also sustainable. And that gets, that gets customers excited. In terms of quality, we know that 40% of customers are willing to pay for high quality or premium products. So that's opening the doors for speciality products, which again, you'll see many of them here. And in terms of lifestyle, there's definitely enormous rise in veganism, and I mentioned earlier, veganism and flexitarianism. Um, and a study by Money Group showed that a quarter of Hong Kong residents practice a flexitarian diet. So can I just get a show of hands? Would you consider yourself a flexitarian? Have you? Yeah, one in the back, another one, that's great, three. So it's just the idea that routinely you are willing to just consciously reduce your um, reliance on animal protein, and it's definitely the way to go. And then on um, wellness, um, the demand for healthier foods, 65% of consumers influenced by health and wellness when choosing what to buy. Um, that's quite fitting because we're in the NOAA section of this trade show. And then in terms of the categories, dairy, meat, and plant-based alternatives are of most importance um, in terms of the categories for consumers. And lastly, the narrative. So food justice, fair livelihoods, positive con consumption. Um, if you haven't seen this report by Food Terror that was sponsored by Danone this last month, it's a really great report. Um, they did a social listening exercise of 225 million um, uh, conversations online over two years, and they were able to deduce there were 14 main shifts. So I, I encourage you to look at that report, um, which a lot of what I'm sharing with you today derives from. Okay, moving on. And I will have 10 minutes at the end if um, you want to ask questions. So do keep your um, questions in mind um, for, for the end. So I'm almost done here. Um, next up, I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership and best practice that we are impressed by, what impresses us in terms of what the food service sector is doing. But first, I'm going to ask you one last question on a poll. So which food businesses come to mind with leading practices in Hong Kong or globally? So I'd love you to take out your phone again for one more poll. So it doesn't have to be in Hong Kong. Of course, many of our members um, come to mind for me, but maybe you're aware of some restaurants that we're not aware of. Because next up, I'm going to show you some of our restaurants that we're impressed by. Okay, so if everyone's got a picture, we can move on to the word cloud. Great, Treehouse and Manor, they're, they're always the first ones. Fantastic. Any others? Oh, Marks and Spencers. Yeah, we do like Marks and Spencers. They have a fantastic um, A plan, I think, is their sustainability strategy. And they've been doing, doing very well over the last 10 years with this plan. Live Zero. So that's more on the retail side. 
So on our website, you'll find about 70 restaurants listed so far in Hong Kong um, that are moving along their sustainability journey. They're not perfect because, you know, it is a journey. We're all trying to, to do our best in the context. So um, you'll be able to see more restaurants there. Um, I'm quite surprised we only have two restaurants that come to mind. Is that because you're not aware that Hong Kong has more sustainable restaurants? Later on at 3 o'clock, we'll have a panel at 3.30 um, of some of Hong Kong's most sustainable bars and restaurants. So if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to, to come back. All right. Let us um, move on then. And I'm going to run through a few really excellent case studies that I think we can take inspiration from. So, has anybody heard of Oaxaca? This is a, um, a chain in the UK, Mexican, and they've done some really interesting, innovative work in order to educate their customers on the sustainability challenges. So through augmented reality, you can take a picture of um, a QR code on their menu and up pops a little um, avatar and he'll tell you some information about the things that you're about to order. So it could be sustainable seafood, you know, it could be nutrients and calories, it could be um, anything about the food that you were not aware of but is of importance. So we think this is a really great idea. It also tells you about allergens and, and any of the sustainability practices. So that, that's a really fun um, project that, that they were able to do. Um, we're still waiting to see um, what the feedback is from customers on that one. Um, salad Stop. So some of you have heard of Salad Stop. They're in, in a lot of um, sort of um, the business district. But in Singapore, they started to put the carbon label on all of their um, dishes. So you could see, you could compare apples to apples from your starters to your mains. You know, what is the impact um, by choosing these foods. So that was, that's very interesting. Um, just going back to Oaxaca, um, one of the things that they did was they, they created um, a 50% vegetarian menu. Um, and that, that's already quite um, progressive in itself. But one of the examples is they made a 70% burger. So 70% of the burger was meat and the other 30% was um, mushrooms and other plant-based ingredients. And they communicated this to their customers. So it went down really well, and customers felt good about choosing a sustainable option. Um, moving on, Sodexo. Um, we have a caterer in the room. So caterers, um, Sodexo is starting to measure and quantify and track and report um, the increase of sales of vegetarian uh, meals. So this is a big trend. Instead of going, taking the negative route and saying we're going to reduce our meat consumption and our meat dishes, they started to track the sales of uh, vegetarian dishes. Um, this is what are quite a few organizations in the UK are encouraging now because we know that meat um, has such a high impact on the environment um, about 30% of our global greenhouse gas emissions come from our food system, whilst half of those emissions at least come from the livestock sector. So what a lot of businesses now are doing is trying to increase their options for tasty plant-based foods. Um, the other one is Overlo Hotels. We have some here in Hong Kong and some in Australia. You may have heard, heard of their campaign, Year of the Veg. So they only had vegetarian foods in their, um, in their hotels. Um, so that is coming to the end of its 12 months. So we'll be tracking how, how they have managed um, to switch and to see um, what the feedback is from their um, customers. So both quite progressive practices. Um, here in Hong Kong, we're really proud that a couple of our members, including the Meraki Group, you may have eaten in, um, in Soho at uh, Bedu or Umanota. Um, they have gone completely plastic-free at the front of house. So really big congratulations to them. Um, they've also been shifting. They've shifted from bottled water to filtration water. You know, why do we need to import water from 
overseas when the water is clean here. So by using a fizzy filtration water system, they can still serve high quality fizzy water. Um, and also the landmark Mandarin Oriental, they are quite well known for all of their work, um, thanks to Richard Ekebus, the chef there, who's been leading a lot of their, their, their um, work in sustainability. So they have removed all plastics in not just the restaurants, but also the rooms. Um, that, that is just for the landmark, not, not a sister company, uh, the, the Mandarin Oriental. Um, and this, this is one that we're really excited about. So our UK office with Pernod Ricard is um, working to um, help businesses to go net zero. So you might have heard of this, this term in the last, last year. Many governments have committed to net zero by 2050. Um, so we're working with um, the bars and restaurants to help them mitigate and reduce and remove emissions from their supply chains. And then we've got this climate positive burger where they're offsetting um, uh, in terms of their emissions. Okay, so finally, what does this mean for you? To summarize, sustainability is more than a trend. It's, it's here and it's here to stay. Um, we expect um, not just consumers um, for the food service, sorry, it is expected that not just consumers, but the food service business needs to mitigate their negative social environmental impact. There's also a lot of value in sustainability. According to some stats, there's 382 billion opportunity um, in sustainability for the fast-moving consumer goods sector. Based on spending power, one of the two global consumers who are already sustainability conscious. So if this is happening in the fast-moving goods, it's definitely going to be moving um, in this direction for restaurants and food service. Sustainable practices don't just drive brand loyalty and manage um, reputational risk, but they contribute to long-term efficiency and resilience of your business. And finally, to provide a um, sustainable food chain, it will require joined up efforts and technology will play a big role in this, as you've seen in some of the examples. Great, um, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly whiz through um, the next section. Um, this is how we, um, um, help customers to, to sort of learn about their sustainability um, journey and what we can do and provide strategy support. Very much educating the members, um, oh, sorry, the businesses at the beginning, because even before we get started, there's, there's a little bit of confusion of what sustainability means for the sector. So we always start with this. And then we help businesses to build a strategy and, of course, take action. We don't want to end up with just this kind of pie in the sky strategy document. So it's important to take action and then of course communicate because if you don't communicate we're not holding you to account. So very important to communicate what we're doing and consider this sort of an ongoing, um, uh, ongoing uh, program. And for the chefs in the room we want to um, have a look at um, One Planet Plate. This is where we can help promote your restaurants at oneplanetplate.org. This is um, one of our websites and campaigns that we were running. I mentioned it earlier on. So please visit oneplanetplate.org if you want to start promoting your sustainable recipes. Okay, I'd really love to take any questions if anybody has any. And this is my my LinkedIn, and we're also running a free Sustainability 101 course in October that you're welcome to sign up to if you do indeed work in the food service sector. Does anybody have any questions before I introduce um, our next speaker? It was quite a lot of information to take in. But do come and, and find me, and I'm around all day um, at the back behind you. If not, I think I'll introduce Don. So Don, um, who's coming on now, is um, one of our supplier members. He's got a fantastic range of alternative straws. Um, we always say, if you cannot use straws, that's great. But if you do need them, then this, um, these guys make a fantastic alternative. It's got a tech background, an engineering background, which makes it even more interesting. So over to you, Don. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Heidi.
So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Don from uh, Jetwell Green Tech. So. Maybe I don't need it. OK, thank you. So uh, today, my topic to talk about is uh, soluble straw is my product. And uh, OK, let me give a brief introduction to um, what is soluble and what is Jetwell. Jetwell Green Hat is a uh, Hong Kong based company. And soluble is a brand we developed in 2018. Um, this brand is mainly for green disposable uh, products development and also manufacture. And the products we have is all designed by ourselves and also we, we hold the patent of the product. Um, in Soluble, we have um, three papillas uh, in our mission. The first being sustainability. I think it's very simple and understand why we need it to be sustainable. sustainability. But having just sustainability is not enough because no successful product can forget about the user experience. So we will put the delightful experience as a very important part in our product development. And just to this point, just this point is not enough because we also have to consider corporate concern. Some product like our straw is purchased not by you and me. It's purchased by the decision maker. For example, the purchase officer, the, the marketing teams, or even the boards of F&B industry. So we have to put all this into account. Let me give an example. So for sustainability, people switch from plastic straw to paper straw. But this awful experience cannot satisfy your customer. So you change to a PLA straw, or some, some of them we use a sugarcane straw, or some called a, a bamboo fiber straws. And very often, they have an advertisement on the, on the internet. Oh, they have a happy toy toys in, 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 the, in the internet. But in fact, this kind of PLA straw or sugarcane straw or bamboo fiber straw, they are not degradable in the marine. It, it gives you the same harmful experience to your sea creatures. So that may be some backfire to your corporate. So, in our development, we always have to consider all these things together to develop a new product. So this one is a very busy slide, sorry. But I just want to show what makes Soilable different from other companies. Uh, for many manufacturers, they only talk about, oh, I'm compostable, I'm biodegradable. But in the real life, um, this is not so simple. This is a chart showing the recorded uh, MSW, municipal solid waste management we have. And that is all the technology for the human being we have. So composting is just part of it. And very often, just use it to handle green and brown waste. So some, that means some garden waste or some uh, uh, this, uh, uh, veg vegetable food waste we will use to handle. But in the real life, very rare you can find these composting facilities, or even most of these composting fa facilities refuse to take in PLA cutleries or containers. There may be some reasons, for example, it's too dirty or too, too take too long time in the composting piles. So they are not going to take it, and, and the compostable plastic like PLA will end up in the landfills or incinerators. That means they were similar, similar to those uh, com uh, conventional plastic. Or what is biodegradable? Biodegradable is nothing about our uh, 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 solid waste management system. It's just a final resort to littering. And in the real life, biodegradable of all the synthetic material will take a very, very long time, maybe decades, maybe even a century. Be especially if you have no oxygen or without an appropriate temperature, it takes too long time for the degradation to happen. Okay. So in soluble, we just regard compostable and biodegradable as a net on. And we will try to commit to the environmental three R's, that is reduce 
And in reduce, we try to reduce the material and try to reduce the energy required to produce a product. And maybe you think, OK, uh, we are making disposable. It may not be reusable. But we always try to make a product have a suitable lifespan. For example, our straw can last for at least five hours. So in a single surface, you don't have to change your straw. And recycle, we try to put more F1 on it. We talk about truly recyclable. That means um, that should be easy for sorting, for laymen. It's, or even the kids, they know how to sort our product. And also, we are, you try to use a homogeneous material. And we make sure the recycling facilities accept the products in the recycling uh, as a, a raw material. So what is uh, traditional paper straws? This uh, animation shows how we make uh, uh, traditional paper straws. And this is made by, usually made by three to five piles of paper. We just roll it and then use a strong glue to hold it together. And this is not a normal paper we are using. Uh, we call it uh, wet strength paper. So this kind of paper uh, is very strong, when you, it, it, even if it is wet. So uh, it is not going to fall apart. But this two product, that means a wet strength paper and a strong glue, make the paper straw difficult to be recycled in paper mills. So that is why people said the paper straw, they are not recyclable. And also here, I list out a lot of um, uh, 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 limitations or complaints of uh, normal paper straw. And here I want to show you uh, one chemical, so-called 3-MCPD here. Um, in Asia, maybe we just talk about these chemicals in our soya sauce. But in paper straws, uh, very interesting, we find this kind of chemical because in a wet strength agent, we have to put this chemical as a part of the active ingredient. And this chemical is um, suspected carcinogenic uh, material. Recently, there's a research showing 80% uh, uh, of paper straw in Germany, in Germany, it's not in Asia, in Germany contains this 3-MCPD close to the upper limit or even over the limit of the required limit. And soluble straw is very straightforward production. We just use one single layer of barrier coated paper and we just roll it up and seal it with ultrasound uh, machine. So it looks very simple, but I can tell you it's not that easy. It's rather difficult to, to make it. So um, what is our raw material? So what is a barrier coated paper? Maybe we all know paper absorb water. Um, to avoid the paper absorb water, we need to put a layer of polymer, layer of uh, plastic, usually plastic, on the top of it so um, it can barrier the water absorption. Uh, usually, we use a PE or more advanced, we use a PLA or PBS in, uh, a, as a barrier coating. But if you try to tear off, sorry, you try to tear off, uh, if you can see, you can see a, a, a a translucent layer of polymer left here. And this layer of polymer is a nightmare for all the paper recycler because when it's going to be puffed, this layer of polymer just swim in the water and they will clog the filter in the recycling machine. And that is the biggest headache for most paper recycler. And nowadays, for soluble, we use this so-called uh, water-based barrier coated paper. This is um, water-based barrier coating. So what is it? It's not so special. Uh, for ladies, when we wake up, you, maybe you, you use a um, uh, uh, cosmetic foundation, or maybe you use a liquid mask. And this kind of product is very similar. It is a liquid base. You coat on a paper and give you a certain kind of uh, barrier properties. It's not 100%. It's not 100%, but it's good enough for the uh, uh, disposable usage. So when you try to tear it off, you see no polymer film on it, just like uh, uh, normal paper. And without a polymer film, that would be perfect for all the paper recyclers. 
So here I list out uh, a number of advantages of our sortable straws. Uh, for example, with our technology, we can save up to 40% of paper. We up to 40%, not, not one four, it's a 40% of paper we can save. And uh, with a single layer structure, we can make a straw, sorry. Yeah, it's rather flexible like a plastic one. So in your lips, you don't feel like a, a, a paper straw. You feel like more like a, a plastic one. And uh, with the barrier coating, it gives a lot of advantage. For example, it's no more sogginess anymore. And uh, we can extend the surface time up to five hours or even longer. And with this barrier coating, we don't need any glue because this layer of barrier already has a sealing effect. And also, we don't need any wet strength agent. So that is uh, that's, that chemical three MCPD will not find in our straw. And this um, video here shows um, the difference between the barrier coated and non-barrier coated. So uh, on the left is your is the non-barrier coated paper, and the right is a uh, barrier coated paper. So I put uh, chocolate milk on it for him five minutes later. Sorry. Put a chocolate milk on it, and five minutes later, I try to wipe it clean. And you will see, um, without barrier coating, already absorbed the chocolate milk, so um, some stain already on it. And with a barrier coating, it's already it's very clean, and nothing left. So, and this dirt is uh, where your, the soggy feeling comes from. And another interesting uh, improvement is uh, maybe you find very rare you have uh, this uh, uh, bubble tea store use paper straws. Not only because the terrible feeling, also the um, traditional paper straw are too strong and too rigid, and the structure make it difficult to make a sharp cut. So all the paper straw in the market is a round cut, but soluble straws is a rather flexible and you can make a very sharp cut, like uh, traditional paper, uh, plastic straws. So you can punch through uh, this uh, bubble tea foil very easy. So, oops, sorry. Yeah, this video shows how easy it is. So we are not so spon sponsored by Gong Cha. Okay, it's nothing about them, but I just can find this tea from China. Okay. Yeah, another advantage of our technology is we can make sure the straw is degradable in the natural environment. For example, here uh, we put straws in a in a laundry bag, and then we put in a and then within 60 days, it's all gone. So in five, 45 days, only one small like a cigarette butt size left, and in 60 days, all gone. So. Our straw will be degradable in all the natural environments, I would say. So I, but I want to say it's not about degradable demonstration. It's just degradable, a de a degradable demonstration. Because biodegradable demonstration is somehow you have to make in the laboratories. <laughs> and traditionally, if you want to um, recycle paper cups, you have to sort it like uh, tetra packs. So you have to recycle it to like uh, you know meal meal to have the recycling. But with a barrier coating, there's no, no polymer film anymore. You can recycle it with any kind of paper products like your A4 paper, like your paper cartoons. So it is easy sorting and then make sure you can recycle with all other paper products. And we also send our products to the West, Western Michigan University which is a uh, well-known third-party uh, paper technology center in the United States. And uh, we send samples to them, and here shows almost 100% of fibers are recovered. Okay. So make a simple math. Um, for one ton of paper, we are talking about 24 trees to grow up for 10 to 20 years. 
But if we want to produce 10 million straws, we need uh, 360 trees. And some said in the United States, we are consuming over 500 million straws every day. That means cutting down 18,000 trees every day if we change all to paper straws. Okay, so it's terrible, right? With our technology, we save maybe 30% of paper. That means already save a lot of trees, first thing. And second thing, we can make all the paper straw recyclable. And I want to say is um, food surface paper is a virgin puff. So um, the fiber is the, in the best condition. So uh, in today, technology can allow those um, uh, fibers recycle up to seven times. So soluble can save the trees and at the same time can let more paper going back to our recycling streams. Um, with the barrier coating technology, we also have another advantage. Is, um, many people, when they use a printed straws, print the paper straw, they always worry about any uh, migration of ink to their drinks. And our technology can make the printing before the coating. That means the printing layer is protected by this uh, barrier coating. And I want to show you this video is uh, on the left is a traditional paper straw, and on the right is our soluble straws. And I try to wipe it with 75% uh, alcohol. Usually in the industry, we all use only 5 to 10% of alcohol wipe. And this time I use a medical gray, 75% uh, alcohol, and then you see the difference. So I very light, it's not rubbing, it's just wiping, okay. Rubbing is very too strong, maybe. I wipe it some 10 times cross. So maybe, sorry, it's not so clear here, but already have some ink migration due to this 75% uh, alcohol wipe. And with the barrier coated layer, covered the printing layer, so it's nothing gone in our soluble straws. So it is ultra safe uh, 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 production method. So it's all about our soluble straws and now I want to introduce a, 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 a paper coffee stir straws. So maybe many of you think, okay, why I bother this product? Because I already use a wooden stick, wooden stirrer to replace a plastic one. So why this is so interesting? Um, first thing, we, we, this product, we ha uh, got two awards, one from Japan, the Good Design Award, and one from Germany, IF Design Award. Um, maybe you think wooden stick is good enough for coffee, but I would say you stir the coffee for one minute, but you need a tree go up for years or decades to have this kind of stick for you. And the end of life is going back to the incinerator or landfill. I would say it may, it may be a green idea, but it's not a sustainable idea. So our third straw is made for uh, zero waste drinking uh, uh, habit. So uh, we can, it's designed to recycle with uh, paper cups. And, and our, uh, the good, one of the good things is we, we can uh, offer a better price compared to wooden stick even. Um, okay. So this is all my presentation today. Um, thank you very much. And our booth is uh, are here in 5B804. Be, uh, welcome to, to visit our booth. And this is my uh, personal content. I think we, our team is rather proficient in the material. So in the future, if you have any question about your material or testing method, anything, please contact us and uh, we can have an open discussion with you. Thank you. So thank you, Don. Uh, is there any questions that you would like to ask? Okay, if not, okay. Maybe you have covered, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, maybe you covered earlier, but I missed it. Um, where is it, where the store produce or, uh, um, yeah. Hello, hello. Thank you. Uh, we have the straw R&D. I think it takes uh, almost 
four years, three, four years time to have this R&D. And, and currently we have our straw manufacturing in China, in Dongguan, in China. Um, but I would say our production method is very uh, highly automatic and, uh, and uh, uh, pollution free. What does it mean by pollution free? Uh, there's no waste water, no uh, smell, nothing. I would say that we don't like traditional paper straw. Because traditional paper straw, you need a glue. And you use a water glue, you, you need to have a very, I would say, closed system in your factory. It's very misty, high humidity uh, uh, working environment. And our paper straw, I think you, you, you can produce anywhere in the world. And the machine is very small. I think it's just like your table. The size is like your table. And very simple operation. Just put the paper, and then put a start, and then it manufacture. So I would say our technology, one good thing is I don't mention here, but I, 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 in the future, we can save a lot of carbon footprints due to transportation. Because we can, if we export, Straws, that means we export air. Uh, I can give you an example. It, for a 20, 20 feet container, only one ton of straws. That means one million straws. But if we export paper, it's talk about 10 tons. It's 10 times safe your, your food, carbon footprint. And we can send it, for example, in the future, maybe to the United States or to Taiwan, UK or Germany to, to have all the production. And one Labor can handle, uh, my experience, maybe over 30 units of machine can handle. And I would say it's very simple to handle and, and also is my, also my dream in the future if we can hire some disabled people to help in the production. Yeah, we, uh, let them to have a chance to work. It's also important. And in the future, the, the machine will be highly automated. Even the quality control will be automated. So uh, yeah, I wish my answer can, can, can testify your needs. Uh, and I would say um, many people ask about what's the price of our straws. And today I can say, I can tell you that um, we are using the medium pri price material and produce the highest quality paper straws. That means, uh, I can say, is, uh, recently I sent uh, some samples to America and they, they, they claim themselves they're making the world best paper straws. But when they see our sample and see our video comparison, they, they have to surrender. <laughs> yeah, because we solve all the limitations and all the problem they have. The only problem of our straw is we can't make it too round. Yeah, I can make it rounder, but if I make it rounder, I will waste more paper. Why I have to do it? I, I want to reduce the weight. For example, um, for a good quality paper straw, like the, 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 the one you're using in uh, Star Dut Dut today in Hong Kong, maybe the weight is 1.5 gram each straw. And our product, maybe only one gram, we can achieve the same size and also even more durable than, than what they are making. And we save a lot of cost because we use much less paper. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>